Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Hi, I'm Allison. I'm an alcoholic. Hi, Allison. You're probably thinking the same thing. I'm thinking, what is she doing up there again? Um, And uh, I'm grateful once again for the opportunity to be here and through a series of events, because as far as I was concerned, I was done last week. Um, (laughs) Through a series of events, this is obviously where I'm supposed to be again tonight. And and also on another note, um, which Dave mentioned, is I'm a booker for two meetings. And that is not an easy job. You are constantly calling people, reminding people, juggling things, cancellations, life circumstances, irresponsibility. All this stuff is constantly thrown on your plate and making last-minute calls and fill-ins. And and, um, and some of that went on here, which is what to do, why I'm sitting up here again, some of it. And... Um, and for that reason alone, to know what it's like to be on the receiving end of someone canceling, having no one to fill in, what are we going to do, um, is the main reason I am once again sitting here. Um, because I don't like when that happens to me. <laughs> so I guess it's kind of selfish. But I kind of feel like if I don't put it out in the universe and if I can be of service and of help, that um, that um, at least... Not putting it out in the universe, which is really just what my job is, is to not put that out in the universe. And um, um, anyway, so I thank the group, Mary Beth in particular, for asking me to come back. Um, I am not as scared and nervous as I was last week. And um, because of that, I sought God with such desperation last week that um, I really think he spoke in and through me. So don't expect as good a job as last week. But... Um, <laughs> What I can tell you is that I do have a lot of um, experience with amends, um, and that's not a good thing, because that means I made an absolute disaster, <laughs> and that's why I have so much experience. Um, and because so many pages in the chapter into action are devoted to amends, um, I want to kind of tell an amends story, touch it to something in the book. I'm not really sure where I'm going with this. I made a little list of people, some specific amends, they just wrote their names down on the list here, so so they will remind me, I, I'm so, excuse me, but I have a few notes with names and stuff, um, but what I want to start with is, um, on page 82, it says, the alcoholic is like a tornado roaring his way through the lives of others, hearts are broken, sweet relationships are dead, affections have been uprooted, selfish and inconsiderate habits have kept the home in turmoil, we feel a man is unthinking when he says that sobriety is not enough. Um, and I am the tornado. There's no ifs, ands, um, or buts about it. I think last week I told you my father called me cancer and my mother called me Hurricane Allison and that I've earned those names. They were not being cruel or mean or abusive. When they called me those things, it was the truth. Um, it tells me that my real, our real, my real purpose, because this book has to be personalized for me, is to fit ourselves to be of maximum service to God and the people about us, which is one of the reasons why I make amends. Um, also so I can mend the broken relationships, the fabric, because I've been um, told that this whole process in my life is like a tapestry, you know, and fears that evil and corroding thread that's through my whole tapestry and these broken relationships are all over the place and I need to mend them. Now that has, what I've also learned is that every single amends, every, I can have done the same harm to two people and every single amends is a different experience. And that I need to, um, what I've been taught and it's my role, but I found out through an amends that was made to me, yes, it is not everyone's role, um, is that I never ever make an amends without Usually it's my sponsor, um, speaking to someone first. That I do not just go to God alone in Allison's little committee and decide what the proper course of action is because things step in that I'm unaware of. Things like, well, they harm me, so I can really leave this little part out. And, um, 
I justify things, I minimize things, I, I, I look at their behaviors, and it's not thorough. It's just not thorough. I mean for it to be, it's just not. So my experience and what I was taught and what I try to pass on is to never make an amends um, without speaking to someone first. Speaking to someone who's got experience also, because I can also seek out people who will close on my crap. And I've been known to do that also. And, and I will also tell you that I have made men's without counsel. And it did not turn out well. And after the fact, when I shared them, thinking I did such a good job, some things were pointed out to me that I I did not see. And so, again, through my own experience, I learned that I don't want to do that anymore because I don't want to have to go back twice. And I find that I do or I'm not free. Um, so, you know, in the seventh step prayer... I ask for God to grant me strength as I go out from here to do his bidding. And for me, it starts with the bidding of making amends. That's what God wants me to do. So I can be of maximum service to God and my fellows. And, um, you know, I have this description I use. Um, you know, when I see you and I get a knot in my stomach, I know there's some very unfinished business there. And I, I, um, that that's it for me, and and which will start me to my first story. There is um, and I'm gonna really try to not share other people's stuff because I have no right to do that. Um, when I came in and and you know you have a lot of amends when you're in AA when you're not living in a solution, and I can tell you that my inventories today most of my amends besides the usual suspects of the family members are to people in AA, and um, but that's not how it started. Um, when I came into a, a very sick woman um, with no God in her life, um, I did it for a particular amount of judging. And um, there was this man who was very nice to me, also had ulterior motives. And he was what I know today, today to be very spiritually sick and not living in a solution just like I was. And um, I found him to be very perverse. Um, he made my skin crawl. <laughs> He started going out with a woman I was friendly with. She was not part of my inner circle. She was no one, um, you know, that we swapped ten steps with or anything like that. And this man's behavior bothered me. Um, I would see him at the quick check hitting on all these other women, and I marched right up to him. What are you doing? You're, you're like cheating on so-and-so. And I was all in his business and in his face. And not only that, I, of course, went and, went and told this woman because... It's very magnanimous of me to involve myself in your life that way because I'm trying to help you. You you just need to see that, that you need to know what uh, you're going out with. Now, they never broke up, and nothing ever changed between them, and, you know, my little plans and designs did not come to fruition. And again, my motives were good. Was You just don't, because, you see, I, I always make everything about me. Because if I was going out with a man that was doing that to me behind my back, somebody better tell me. So I was trying to be helpful because I didn't know how to mind my own business and take a look at myself. And there was a lot more harms involved, but that kind of sums it up. So fast forward to two years ago. This man, now I had been in and around AA for, um, well, now it's almost 11 years, so say nine years at this point. And um, what happens is, is I run into him here. And I get that knot in my stomach. Haven't seen him for a number of years. We're talking from nine years, eight years ago, to seven years later. And I run into him here, and I have that knot in my stomach. But I, again, didn't have the words for that. And I'm thinking, ooh, you know, we'll, we'll call him Jim. His name's not Jim. Jim's here. Ugh. You know, and I'm thinking, you know, I'll sit in the back row. I'll sit away from him. I'll, absolutely no freedom. No freedom and absolutely blocked from God. What happens is I'm going through inventory at this time. He's on my my resentment list. Um, we cover everything. He's absolutely on my men's list. Out of nowhere. Now, what I didn't know is he got hooked up with some people here, and he started living in a solution, and my phone rings. Like two days after we cover this guy, my inventory was not a one-day process, okay? We cover this guy thoroughly on my inventory. He calls me, do I have some time? Can he come by? He needs to make amends to um, words I never thought I'd hear. 
I called my sponsor immediately with this, like, um, you know, revelation. And I said, what do I do? Because he's on my list, but we're, we weren't exactly there yet. And she says, go with your gut, and if the time's right, she said, trust your instincts, absolutely make your amends, but let him come there for what he's coming there for. So this goes down. He makes amends. It was, it was, it was beautiful. Um, and then I ask him if he has a few minutes, and I make my amends. And I'm quite frank with how I um, had no business being in his business, how I had no business judging him, how incredibly spiritually sick I was, how, um, you know, and who, this, like I said, this woman was an acquaintance. This wasn't like my best friend whose back I got, you know. Um, this was me being a menace in society. And um, this man starts crying. And like I said, he's he's got to have, I think, like 13, 15 years now. And he starts crying and says, you know how long I've been in AA and nobody's ever made a mess to me? And you know we all harm each other here. It just happens. We don't do it on purpose, but it just happens along the growing process, you know. And I see this man today. I run into him, and I have joy when I see him. I think, oh, good, Jim's here. That knot is gone. And that story in particular is the story of all my amends today. Because I don't, I didn't even know until this experience that I got these knots that bound me. Now, just like alcohol bound me, just like my selfishness bound me, just like my resentments bound me, here I am still bound and I'm on the ninth step. You know, how, where do I want to get free? So this, this is, I mean, this guy and I were little specks on each other's path. We had no real harms. Were the things I mentioned real? Yes. But I mean, in the big scheme of things, we're just another person who pissed each other off with some little crap. But the freedom I received from this, and I can tell you, I, I think I mentioned this week, I do a lot of visualization. And I, I, my favorite thing is the St. Francis Prayer, and I have always wanted to be this channel. Didn't know how to get there, so I got the instructions in the big book. And I picture this block channel, and when it comes to men's in particular, I picture cinder blocks. Forget about garbage and leaves that, you know, you can take a blower and blow away. I picture cinder blocks. And when I made this amends, this cinder block got removed. I mean, I felt it. And to look at him and be free. He's free when he sees me. I'm free when I see him. And not only that, but we have a genuine affection for each other today. And he's not in my life. He's not... Do you know what I mean? He's just a fellow traveler on this broad highway. And and it was profound. I For me, I don't know what you're getting from me sharing this, but for me it was. Um, I worked at this car dealership four days. <laughs> that's, that's how unplayable I was. And let me tell you how ego filled this job. I interviewed for like two weeks. There was like a mass of women. Sure, this is during my drinking. And um, I interviewed, and there were all these women, and I went back, and there were like five of us, and I got the job, and <laughs> I'm better than all of you. And um, I'm drunk every day, and um, I literally, like, just pass out on my desk one day, and, like, the phone wakes me up. And I'm thinking this is okay because I'm answering the phone. Needless to say, um, I robbed these people. I robbed them of a good employee. I robbed them of possibly having someone better because I absolutely misrepresented myself, lied through my teeth. Um, I judged them. I couldn't stand the man who was the general manager. I thought he was a priss, and he was on TV on commercials all the time, and he was this buttoned up, like, stay inside the lines, um, follow the rules of life, which I had no idea about kind of guy. And, you know, the real truth was he knew how to live, and I didn't, so I was afraid of him. And that just kind of sums it up. Again, very long list. I'm summer, I'm summarizing my my harms, but very long list when looked into in inventory. And my index card was full with with things, and particularly how I viewed this man who probably had so much to offer my life, and yet I was so afraid. So here I am, sober, and I see this man on the TV, and I'm like, Oh my God, I worked him. Because when you're in a 10-year blockout, you have 
my experience of the men's is more is being revealed constantly, particularly in my final 10 years of drinking. And I'm like, oh, my God, I know that man. Oh, my God. And immediately I am within a couple of days at this place, and I walk in, and um, I'm terrified. And this is, okay, this is drinking. This is good. 20 years ago, like 18, 20 years, and this man still works there, and I walk in, and I ask to see him, and they're like, who are you? What is this about? And I give my name and say it's personal, and, and to please just, and he is, runs the whole place. He is, you know, the general manager, part owner, married into, I mean, this guy's it. You know, you kind of, I think I should have called and scheduled an appointment, but I just went. And I went with God. And, um, and I was literally trembling walking in there. I had, and it wasn't fear. It was just the truth. And, um, this man agreed to see me. I said, could you please just let him know I need like five minutes of his time. And I went with my index card because, let me tell you, I knew everything I needed to do. But that gave me a sense of security. It also keeps me sticking to the script. Because I write down what I'm told to do. I follow directions. Because, again, I will change one word and the whole amends goes astray. So I have this card of exactly what I'm going to say. And I go into this man's office and I, I say, hi, I'm Allison Kohler. I used to work here. Um, I think, you know, about 18 years ago. And he looks at me and tells me he doesn't remember me at all, but please sit down. What can he do for me? And he's exactly the same. Um, and I didn't judge him the way I used to, you know, that buttoned-up kind of hair. He's exactly the same, dressed the same, acted the same, everything the same. But yet I'm looking through a new pair of glasses. And I tell him, I tell him that I'm in recovery. I tell him that... um that I'm in program recovery and that um, I tell him that whether or not I drink again depends on I need to clean up the wreckage of my past and working here was part of the wreckage of my past. And I'm clear cut about who. And, you know, there's a whole different school. And do you say you're an alcoholic? Do you not? This might hurt. And certain situations, I think different things. And this one, you know, I bring that to the table every opportunity I get because what I am is a walking big book then. What I am is an example of how this program works. And, you know, I want to carry that message. I, I, um, now, the best way I can carry it is through my actions in my life. But when I'm going to say I'm sorry to you, I want to tell you it's because of the power of this program. It's because I crawl before no one when it comes to my God. My book tells me this in this step in particular. I bow before no one when it comes to my God. And I have no problem and never have. But my first couple, I can say, I was hesitant. Oh, my God, I'm going to say, God, what are they going to think of me? I'm going to say a 12-step program. What and I don't, I have no no fears or walls or any of that today, and I haven't for some time with that. And I tell this man that um, I agreed to go to any length for my sobriety and cleaning up the wreckage in my past. And I go on um, to make my amends for being a bad employee, um, that I'm willing to even repay the salary I got paid because it was given to me unfairly. I ask him if there's any way I can. I ask him the questions I've been taught to ask. You know, is there any other harms I'm unaware of? Is there anything you need to say to me, and how can I set these matters straight? And I ask these men these questions, trembling, look, looking up, looking back down, looking up, and I'm almost like here. And this man says he starts to recall me. <laughs> and... um <laughs> And I have to tell you, it, it's, it's while I'm there, and this man is so kind to me, and he tells me how grateful he is that I came there, that they're a company that really prides themselves on the unity, to sum it up, and um, they thought they did something wrong. And even though it's so many years later, he's so glad to know it was me, not them. And... I thought about what a missed opportunity I had to be a part. I could have had a very good job there for a long time. And not only that, my morals could have been enriched. My life could have been enriched. I could have had real people who care about each other around me. Instead, I chose the insane world of who's buying next and who's got what, and I'll hang out with you. Or the unemployment line, um... And, and this, again, little speck in my harms. I'm obviously starting with some little harms. Um, you know, and yet profound, I walked outside to my car and sat in their parking lot weeping. 
And I don't mean, you know, weeping. I mean from my toes, I felt God once again in and through me. And I felt this man, you know, I think I prefer people today to tell me more. Because I don't really know the destruction I've done. I only know my viewpoint. And, you know, I know a lot of my viewpoint is not accurate when you drink and drug the way I do. I I can tell you about my first drink, and I can tell you in crystal clear detail about it. But I can t- also tell you that that was not the way it really happened. I just don't know. That's always the way I've imagined it to happen. You know, the experience I had, the magic I felt, that isn't what was going on. I was feeling loved and complete and full, and that's not what was taking place out here. But that's the way I remember my first drink. You know, so I'm aware that I need more information. I need to know more of my character defects. I need to know how much damage I really did. So those people that tell me I'm just glad you're sober and thanks and I appreciate your apology, but really unnecessary, and I've had plenty of those, I don't really grow from those. I get a little freer, but I don't grow. Um, I grow because I'm willing, and willingness is always the key. Um, I mentioned last week, and I just want to mention this one um, in a little more detail, is um, I harmed a great many men. Um, and a lot of men paid the price for other men harming me. And um, one man in particular left the state, and then I, um, point blank, in my face, because of me. And now, do I think I'm that powerful? No. But the truth is I did that much harm that this man needed to get out of everything that reminded me of him. And this man loved me. Um, and treated me with respect and love at all times. And I never once gave that back to him. Um, and I have made so many attempts. This man will not accept even speaking to me, let alone men's. And, um, you know, I used to brag that I made, <laughs> uh, some guy left to say it over me. You know, um, what a great feat that is now. I would still do anything today to make amends to this guy. I mean, this has been seven years, six, six or seven years. Um, and if he, if I knew, and he lives, I believe, in Washington, Maryland area, if I was told at the end of this meeting, so-and-so is willing to speak to you, I would get in the car and drive there right from here. I would call someone to go check in with my son, and I would go. And I will tell you that I am free there because I have the willingness. When given the opportunity... And I will continue to know that I owe this man an amends, but I'm absolutely willing, so I am free. I'm completely willing to own my part. And the thing is, I think this man really believes he did something. And he, I I can't even imagine what I put on to the next person he went out with, the fear he brought along, the fear of treating someone with love and respect and look at the crap you get back. Again, on the outside, I'm apparently a very good girlfriend. But when it's one-to-one and when it's um, intimacy and when it's, you know, about bringing my 50% and, and even more than that when you can't, forget about it. If, you, if you're not, you know, and the truth is I had, and this is one of the biggest amends for me in my living today, is um, I had unfinished business in another relationship and I was not available to this man. In any way. Sexually, yes, but it meant nothing to me. It meant nothing to me because it wasn't the man I wanted to be with. I, because you see, I, I don't know how to live in the moment. I'm stuck in yesterday with the guy that got away that I want to be with. And, and the thing is, I don't even know if that's real. But because he left and I'm not with him anymore, I want to be with him and you're all going to pay a price and you're going to treat me good and treat me nice. Well, I can't be with the man I really want to be with. And meanwhile, I'm completely spiritually, emotionally, um, intellectually unavailable to you and I judge you and you're just less than because you're not the man I really want to be with. He, and I never look at you for you. I don't do that today. I do not go in to new relationships when I am still healing. I um, was madly in love with somebody last year and it ended badly. Not on my end. I was lied to. It was, it was not pretty. And um I have not been involved with anybody since because I needed to heal. I needed to do inventory. And opportunities have been there and, and, and other things have come along. But I just don't, I don't do it because I'm, I'm not going to create wreckage in your life today because parts of me are unavailable. You know, so from that, I've now been given more life skills to not cre- creating harms. 
you know, regardless of if I was in a good relationship, a bad relationship, whatever, I need to heal, put it behind me, and be available. Because I've walked around my entire life unavailable to everybody, not just men. Every person was of no value to me. They were, um, people were to be used for my, for me. So a lot, my journey today, you know, a very wise woman told me being sober is about having relationships. And I, I was like, huh? What? And I sat in her living room, what? And I don't think I've ever was told more true with him. Because as I said last week, I have problems towards life, towards God's universe, and towards my fellows. Those are all relationships. Oh, and towards myself. So I had to, again, in one, two, and three, get right with God. In four through seven, get right with myself. In eight and nine, get right with my fellows. And um, being sober is about having relationships. Wouldn't you know? What do I have to bring to the table today? Not what can I take? You know, um, I've had experiences in friendships that the friendships turned out to be um, not what I considered what I want and what unacceptable behavior for my life today. Not necessarily harmful, but just, um, but all I can do is be the friend I would want in return. It doesn't mean you are the same friend back. And when I find things unacceptable or that don't work for my life, and I know that I can move away and also change the relationship. You know, it can just be an acquaintance instead of a close friend. Because somewhere within me, I'm starting to get filled with resentment again. I'm starting to get blocked with God. Because I keep trying to make things that don't work, work. Again, I have a long history of that. Let me switch from vodka. You know, it, it always, every single step is about my first step experience. You know, I can I can take you backwards through character defects and through inventory process, but it all leads back to if I don't do this, am I going to drink again? Because somewhere along the way, I surely digress, and, and I believe that. And that's why all means all in the eighth step, because I do believe if I don't do all my amends, because my own experiences showed me, I will drink again after a period of time. So I know today to see the truth about things. Again, my truth is not necessarily the real truth. We need to discuss with others. Um, some things. I want to talk about my family. I was going to save that to the end. Um, yes, there is a long period of reconstruction ahead. We must take the lead. A remorseful mumbling that we aren't, so, we are sorry, won't fill the bill at all. Our behavior will convince them more than our words. And there's a whole bunch of stuff in here on the family. Hurricane, Allison, cancer, it's not pretty. Um, I did everything you could possibly do to these people, my mother and father. Um, I also lived in the fact that there were harms done to me. Um, even when I got sober, I was still harming them. I stole a tremendous amount of money. I uh, always, because they owe me, and the world owes me, and Everybody better take care of me, and I'm entitled. I love that entitleitis disease. And um, the anger put my son on their doorstep, made it their problem, because uh, I was a neglectful and unfit mother. Because, again, I, I don't... It's not like I was that on purpose. I don't know how to live. How the heck am I going to be a mother? How am I going to take care of another human being? I don't even know how to take care of me. Um, you know, I would actually have to go dig up the card, because the list is long. And, and, and the, the fact that I sit here almost going, what were my harms, um, is good because that will tell you that a lot of reconstruction has been done. Um, I went to them and, and made the formal amends, you know, um, that I was spiritually sick, um, that I blamed them, that I judged them, that I expected them to be other things, that I didn't value them for the people they were. Um, I asked for their patience while I learned how to live and while I got right in my own life. And I cleaned my side of the street. <sighs> Two and a half years ago, my parents moved. And um, 
They moved to Florida. They had a house built. They have three cars, and they're a little bit older. So a part of my men's was living in See, because I can drive cars, and I can pack boxes, and these are things I can do. So to make things easier for them, um, I gave them a month of my life. I uh, drove my mother down in one car um, in a van, and I unpacked the entire van and went to the closing with her, and my mother did not lift one finger. And um, and I did not want her to, nor did she offer. So, <laughs> but um, and I went there with this. Now, anybody that knows me, I'm a big sun worshiper. I did not spend one day in the sun in Florida um, for a month. It was not um, in God's plan. It was not in my plan. I was not there for anything selfish or any anything that fed my ego. Like I'm going to go home with a tan and tell people I was in Florida for a month. And nothing like that. Um, I spent three days with my mother. I flew home. I got in another car of theirs, and I drove myself down. I left the same time as the moving truck, and I um, supervised the moving. I There were over 500 boxes. My parents had a very large home. And um, I spent um, hours every morning and almost complete days at times, I mean a full day's work, unpacking. And I would say to my mother, I mean, it's a brand new house I'd never seen before. Where do you want your dishes? I don't know. I'll simply pick a cabinet. She never lifted a finger. Again, never offered. Um, and I, they had these huge walk-in closets, and some of the stuff said mom's clothes, or I opened suitcases. And that I put my mother's stuff on one side and my father's stuff on the other. And when I was all done with these boxes, and my mother said, um, could you organize my closet? You do that really well. And I said, you're not even going to put your own underwear away? And she said, I'd, I'd really appreciate the help. So I did. And I spent a month there giving service like I really never have. There wasn't, I have to tell you, my mother didn't take me out to dinner. My mother loves to go out to dinner. She didn't ask me what I want for lunch. And I didn't have these expectations on her. I took care of everything and then some. It, it came from within. It was not a hard task. I didn't have to search and seek out God for this. All I know is that I brought devastation to these people's lives for years. And if I could help make some of these older years a little easier, I'll do it. If that meant staying a year, I'll do it. I mean, I had to make plans for my own life. You know, yeah, I can't, I got th- at that time three dogs, a kid, bills, you know, I, I got uh, responsibilities. But this is where I was supposed to be and it never was a doubt to me. My dad was up closing up the house here in Jersey, and um, we actually passed. My flight home, he drove the last car down. And when he got there, I got home before him. I got a phone call. Um, and i got to tell you, my parents have been crystal clear that you could pay us back every day of your life, and you will still owe us. And I never debated that statement. I just thought if that's his anger and that's the way he views me, that's okay. And my father called me. And again, I had no motives except, you know what? I can unpack boxes and I can drive cars, so I'll do this. Because this would be a hardship for them. My mother can't drive straight through to Florida. I enjoy that stuff. I was always Miss Road Trip when I was using. Why can't I be Miss Road Trip to help a loved one who has bailed me out of... You know, I got to tell you, 10-year blackout, completely irresponsible, completely unemployable. Not only did I give them my son to take care of, but I used to walk in their house, coming down on my way to get high, drunk, whatever, and leave a little pile of bills on the corner of my mother's kitchen table and just leave them. She paid them. And if she didn't, or if she even questioned me, the emotional abuse I put on them was ugly. Uh, you should be convicted of a crime the way I spoke to them. How dare they? And they're the reason I don't know how to live. And, and that's just the stuff I can say in front of a microphone. Because it, it was, I was not a pleasant person. And I was not a good daughter. I was not a good anything. So my father calls me in tears. And he says, I, I mean, they're enti- they have absolutely nothing to do. <laughs> You know, unless they want to change the sock drawer from the bottom drawer to the top drawer, they have nothing to do. Their food's put away. They're, they're everything. You know, there, there are sheets in the guest rooms on the beds. There was no stone left unturned there. Um, and my father calls me crying. He, he just is overwhelmed. And, um, he's crying and says to me, we're even. 
And I'm like, this is not a man who speaks of anything emotionally. And he said, I, I can't believe what you've done for our lives and us and whatever's gone on in the past. We are even. From this, and this really, I, from this, my mother changes her will. Now, I was never out of the will, although I should have been. And make sure that my mortgage gets paid off if anything happens to them, that my son and I will never have to worry about having a roof over our heads. I might add that I got a phone call from my sister, who's executor. You know, you're such a screw-up that you're still taken from the rest of us. Because now Mom changed her will. I mean, it started a whole nother drama. And I said, Michelle, I, d I didn't ask for this. You know, I don't need this today. But if these are mom's wishes, who are you or I to question them? But I have no intention of taking anything that she feels she wants to give to you. You know? But again, now, I don't, I don't know. I don't even ask about this because the truth is I could go to my parents today and need something and they would be there. And I, I told you last week, I harmed my mother badly three weeks ago. I also made amends. She also has still let me know. She's still not sure where she stands on things. And I say, Mom, you can continue to live in the problem that happened weeks ago, but I'm living in the solution. I'd like to move forward from here. But you do what you need to do, and I'm going to continue to move forward. I, and she had me saying I'm sorry again when I talked to her this week, and if that's what she's needed, to hear I'm sorry again for whatever purpose that serves for her, I can do that. I can do that today, no problem. Now, so while my, what happens is my father's closing up the house, but they don't sell it then. And um, they still come back three times a year for business. And when they come back, they're sleeping on the two mattresses on the floor in this big empty house. And my father ends up selling the house one time when he's here by himself. And he's really closing up the house. He calls me out of nowhere and says, oh, my God, I, I'm so far behind you. Um, he calls me out of nowhere and says, um, Elson, I want to go to my mother's graveside in Staten Island. Can you come with me? No, 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 I, I don't even know where it's coming from, but no, I can't go with you. And he's like, please, I can't go alone. I desperately need you to go with me. I said, I'll call you back in a few minutes. And I hang up and I call my sponsor. And I have this flashback of the most harmful thing I've ever done. But I don't really know all the details. I just remember it was my grandmother's funeral. I remember the police, but I don't know anything else. And I know that I made that day an absolute hell for my father, because what I didn't know then is I was separated from alcohol for a period of time to be with my family because we're, we don't drink. So there's not like there's booze in the house or, you know, while people are, um, I'm Jewish, sit and shiver or, or any of this. But, I mean, I devastated my father that day. But I don't have all the details. So I know this much at this point. Flash is back. And my sponsor tells me I need to go and that I, at this point, own amends to my grandparents anyway. So I have the opportunity to go to Graveside and do that. And she tells me, once again, to trust my instincts regarding my father. And I just know it's bad. And um, I go with my father, and we end up in the car talking about the steps of AA. has nothing to do with men's. Nothing. I'm telling my father what a fourth step is. And there was a lot of violence in my house. And my dad's like, where's the column that says maybe the person thought they were helping you when they were hitting you? I'm like, Dad, Dad, this is... <laughs> This is, and I'm really breaking, cause he's trying to, I guess, get free himself from the violence that was inflicted. And I'm like, Dad, this is about me. This is about my harms. Doesn't matter about the harms done to me. And I'm, I'm, we're really having this whole process talk about the process of recovery. So we get to the graveside. And, and, and I can tell you it definitely is bringing my father and I closer to this um, non-emotional relationship. It's bringing emotion in. It's also bringing God in, a word that was never mentioned in my house. What are the odds of that? Um, and I make my grave set amends, my father, and I look at my grandmother's tombstone. My birthday is March 10th. St. Patrick's Day is March 17th. Now, I told you I drank and drugged 24-7. That was the craziest week. I really had this mentality of, you know, I gotta go full board on my birthday and I gotta go full board on uh, St. Patrick's Day. See, just, especially if it turned out on Friday or Saturday, it was like an ugly, ugly 10 days. And I mean uglier than anything else that went on. And I look at my grandmother's headstone and it says March 12th. I didn't even know when my own grandmother died. And I look at the year and it's the year I took off 
I hit a bottom to Daytona Beach. I called my brother up. It was my first moment of clarity and said, David, there's something incredibly wrong with me. I had this absolute moment of clarity. I was 21. And he says, Allison, it's not you. It's mom and dad. Get out of there and come down to me. Oh, it is them. Okay. Moment of clarity right out the window. And I'm like, oh, my God, I was so sick then. And a lot of pieces start to fall into place. And we're at the grave, and I tell my father that I don't really know what I did the day his mother died, but I know that I made his life a living, living hell on probably the saddest day of his life, and that I was drunk and high, and I didn't know how sick I was, and I didn't know I had a disease, and I'm so sorry that I couldn't have been a daughter. And it went on. And my father starts hysterical crying, saying, I am so sorry that I couldn't see how bad you needed me and that I wasn't there as your father. And we are standing in front of my grandparents' gravesite, hugging each other. Again, not an emotional family. No place does God get mentioned and the word love and hugs were just not part of my existence. I'm okay. I'm okay. And, um, but thank you. Um, and this is powerful, but this story gets better. Again, I still don't really know what I did that day. <laughs> and I don't want to know because we have a long drive home from Staten Island. <laughs> but my father's brother lives around the corner. And he cleaned out the house and he found these pictures and they're strange. I come, I don't even know half of my cousins. I mean, I had resentments galore over the fact that I have lack of family because my family doesn't know how to have relationships. Geez, I wonder how I learned that. Um, but it's my responsibility today to make relationships with cousins, with aunts, with uncles. It's not their fault. Now it's on my plate. And I learned that through this process. If I want a cousin, I go be a cousin. I go introduce myself and find these people. Um, anyhow, my father's going to leave some pictures in his brother's mailbox. And we're going home. I'm like, you're here, and you're not going to even say hello to your own brother. You're moving 1,200 miles away, and you're not even going to say goodbye. And I'm like, and I told him, I'm getting out of this car if that's how you're behaving. And and I took him through a fourth and a fifth step in the car. And my f- father went, and I said, that's just wrong. You're keeping this ball rolling. Somebody's got to make the move here. I'm tired of all these broken relationships. And... I'm helping him find his part and what can he do to set this right. And my father goes to the door and you see some, I'm in the car and you see these exchanges and then you see hugs and then you see this. We ended up staying there all day. The two of them were fighting and I kept stepping in. And I don't mean budding in where I don't belong. Is this how you two want to relive the rest of your life? Do you care who did what when? Or do you want to be brothers? Where did I learn this? My immense process carried into my father's life that day. It was, we were on completely new footing, our roots grasp new soil all the way around. Look at how this just multiplied. From one simple, will you go with me to my mother's grave? I will add, to wrap this story up, when we got about ten minutes from home, I very shyly said, you know, I don't really know how I completely harmed you that day, and I needed to, to know. You know, and um, it turned out it was, I called the police on myself, and, and I'm not even going to get into it all, but um, I was given absolute freedom, and my father was given a very long overdue amends that I had no recollection of because I was, um, you know, in a blackout for 10 years, wreaking havoc, being a tornado like I do. Um, oh, I am absolutely accountable to this group. Last week I told you about amends I was absolutely unwilling to make. In this book, I believe it's referred to as um, the question of how to approach the man we hate will arise. <laughs> well, there we were, and I told you last week, I absolutely hate this woman. And by making myself accountable here, there was no way my ego was letting me show up here with an unfinished amends this week. So in this case, my ego was helpful because it helped me clear away a blockage between me and God. Um I went from unwilling to willing to write a letter, which my sponsor left in my face over, um, to I'll make a phone call to a done amends. Um, I did it exactly as the directions say in this book, when it's someone you don't like. I might also add, this was not my first amends to this woman, because she was on my resentment inventory, and I've made amends before, but this was a particular harm, not a, 
attitude of how I treat you harm. And um, it tells me what to do. We go to him in a helpful and forgiving sin, uh, spirit, confessing our former ill feelings and expressing our regret under no condition do we criticize such a person or argue. We simply tell him that we will never get over drinking until we have done our utmost to straighten out the past. I said, hi, as you know, I'm in a program of recovery. My recovery demands that I clean up any harms, um, that particularly ones that block me from God. I do not want to return to drinking, and um, my behavior three weeks ago was very harmful to you. I'm sorry for anything it might have done to you, um, and I want to apologize. I was not acting sane, and I um, I know my behavior hurt, hurt you. And I, I cleaned my side of the street. She um, did not react the way I thought. I thought I'd get, um, you know, the the condescending whatever attitude I usually get from her. I got nothing. I got, she didn't tell me anything. She went, yeah, okay. And you know what? My side's clean. You know, it's clean. I made the amends. I apologized for my behavior. I said how utterly wrong it was. And I absolutely gave my reason. I do not want it to return to drinking. I um, made a deal with God that all made, means all, and I will remove whatever blocks me from God. Um, and so that was done. So I'm current. Um, <laughs> uh, financial amends real quickly. Um, I You don't show up for life for 27, 28 years. You've got a lot of financial wreckage. Have to start somewhere. Attitudes about it all. It got told to me point blank, Allison, they don't want your money. They want their money. Oh, well, that kind of changes things, doesn't it? <laughs> I can't walk around with that attitude anymore. I have two unfinished financial amends. And when I tell you the list was long, and I can also tell you that these two aren't that big. I just finished about a month ago. I have approached these people. One doctor in particular, I've paid off for two years consistently. I got the most beautiful letter in January from this woman who treated me. Who also knows, I'm a recovering member of Alcoholics Anonymous, who also knows that I lied to her, that also knows that I wasted her time, even though I was paying her for a long time, that knows who and what I am. Um, and I got the most beautiful letter for thank you for your consistency and for keeping your word. And, and this woman could have wrecked, she could have ruined my credit more, could have turned me into collection, never did. I found out the, about this thousands of dollars, hundred here. A hundred there. Instead of, you know, I'd like a new pair of shoes. You know, I owe that doctor some money. And that's where it went. Um, and when I came into a little more money in the last year, she got 200 at a time. Instead of, you know, I could get ahead on my cable bill. And we could buy some filet mignon instead of, you know, just chuck steak. So, no, no, I have amends to make. Um, and I had a ton. I have two more financial and I'm still chugging along. And they will be done, I say three months max. It might be sooner. Um, weird thing is, yesterday, I got two things in the mail, one in my own bail, mailbox, one in my business P.O. box, of um, over 10-year-old financial debts through collection agencies, both on the same day, won $50 for a public defender in 1996. I'm like, I called. I said, I have absolutely no recollection of this. I've really never been in that much legal trouble. What is this but? If you can prove to me this is mine, I will absolutely pay it immediately. They're like, you want to set up a payment plan? No, no, no. I will take care of this today. And I had to fill, I had to write a letter so records could be, both of them. I, I called immediately. My first thought is, oh, does this never end? But, um, you know, my, my second thought was, what do I got to do to set this right? Naturally, these are now becoming my natural instincts. Who would have thought? Again, I didn't come here. To pay you anything, I didn't come here to find God. Um, you know, I was told behaviors, um, amends are a lot about um, to stop doing the behaviors, behaviors, to not defend anything I did in the harm. And when I'm making the amends, how would I want to be approached? Um, there was a cop I did a great deal of harm to. Great deal of harm. <laughs> uh, many cops. Oh, I owed the entire Rockaway Township Police Station, including the um, chief of police who I decided to call at 6 a.m. and tell him what for, which was just 
the end of it where I also got informed if I do that ever again, I will be in jail. Um, and I thought I had absolutely every right because I'm up at 6 a.m., drunk and high out of my mind, that you should be up too. And you need to deal with me at 6 a.m. And um, this one cup in particular, um, I just don't have the time to go into the list. But needless to say, I showed up at his front door to ask him why he mailed me his front door where his wife answered and his two twin sons were. I mean, we're talking not just harm to this man, let alone the fact that I lied to him when he pulled me over, that I then had a, a friend of mine who was a cop run, and he found out I lied through a series of events and was, like, coming after me, you know, full barrel, because um, he was so kind to me. Um, I got caught driving without a license. I told him I was my sister. My son and my mother were in the car. I'm real walking example of the big book. I'm telling him I'm my sister and that that's my nephew. Yeah, I'm sober. <laughs> This is without a drink. And um, because I don't want to get in trouble because I'm driving without a license. Because, again, I don't know that rules actually apply to me. They apply for you, but I'm different. And um, and I'm thinking it's okay, and I'm thinking this is so cool that I just got away with all this. And because my sister is such a cl- – oh, I didn't ask my sister her permission. Is that harmful? Um, because cause I could have just gotten a ticket on her license. Um so I'm not asking my sister's permission, and because my sister has no points and is uh, seven years older than me, he lets me go because I've lived this clean life for a long time. I, I humiliated this man, lied to him, and this was just one instance with this guy. And then when it – and I have a sergeant friend run interference that grew up with me who just is like Allison, does the drama ever stop with you? And he asks this guy for a personal favor, and he lets it go but I have to go apologize to the man to his face, which I do, because I'm getting away with it. Sure, I'll, I'll apologize. And um, he tells me, if I ever have the opportunity to nail you again, you're done. Allison relapses. Allison hits someone in a blackout, takes off. What are the odds that in the town I live in with 40-something cops, the cop that gets called to this hit and run is him? If there's a God in your life, it's my odds. And... um they described the car. He goes right to my garage. He, I mean, do you know how many people live in Rockaway Township? How this person even knew it was like someone who lived there? It could have been just, a, it was on the highway. This, it just all comes back to me. I get seven tickets in the mail. I go to this guy's house. What are you doing? I'm yelling at him, his wife. I mean, needless to say, I go to make amends to this guy some years later. The list was long. Um, I called him first, asked him for a few minutes of his time. Allison, what's going on? He said, you'll understand. I need to speak with you. It's it's no trouble, and, and, and I really just need to speak to you. It's important. He he calls me. He gives me an appointment. I go down with my index card, and um, and we sit, and I make a full, absolute full amends. And he keeps stopping me, and I kept asking him not to, to let me finish, and he would get an opportunity to say anything he needed to, that this is so unnecessary. He knows the person I am today. He sees me. He has since become the juvenile officer. He's been in constant contact with my son the last several years. He knows that my son has a mother today that shows up for him. He's seen me at sporting events and school functions and knows that I am walking a much different pathway. Turns out, as this juvenile officer, he's in touch with a lot of young people who need this program. He's involved in taking young people to detox and rehab and heroin and alcohol. And I let him know that at any time, that anybody he's helping or is involved with, that I am absolutely available. And if it's a man or a young young man that I know enough men that would gladly step up to the plate, and we start talking about some solutions for other people's problems. Talk about a knot in your stomach. Talk about cinder blocks. Talk about every time you see a cop car. Talk about because I'm still walking around with baggage. I'm afraid. I'm afraid. I, I wave to cops today. Hey, how you doing? Good to see you. Hated cops. Oh, they were all, and the amends I owed was like unbelievable. Um, I, uh, my son, this one list is long. Resentments were even longer. My resentments at him, I was very angry that I had this kid. He was very angry that I couldn't go live my life. Basically, to sum it up, um, I was neglectful and selfish. And um, and I put all my needs before his, particularly when I first got sober. I'll show up for the fun. I'll show up to go out to dinner. You go buy the sneakers. You go buy the underwear. You got money. 
You take care of him. Um, what I do today, my son, is my biggest love and amends. Is, um, I let my son, um, I validate his feelings. I, um, I ask him what it is I need to do to make things easier for him to speak to me, to let me know what's going on in his life. And, um, it is definitely the hardest test because this kid tests me. You're going to leave now? Oh, you know, I got to tell you, he'll also be the first one to tell you he doesn't remember when mom wasn't there. He's had a mother that has shown up for him for a good number of years now. Um, and we're all the better for it. Um, but that, uh, uh, you know, I talk about this resentment list, the majority of it really turned out to be resentments at myself, even though they were all listed under his names, under his name. It was all resentment at myself. Um, I, uh, I want to talk about character assassination, because that was big for me. Gossip and character assassination. Um, I'm going to mention a little one, which is not usually how I did it. Um, as a sober woman, uh, several years ago, um, I was sponsoring another woman who I also knew her mother. Her mother calls me one day, ends up meeting another one of us, tells me the girl's my age, lives in this area, sober, is almost the same number of years. Do I know her? What's her name? She tells me her name. I say, yeah, I know her. She says, I would think you two would be close. You're very similar. And I said, no, she's just an acquaintance because, and I said one negative statement about her that I didn't think was negative. I just said why I'm not close with her. This woman who knew the woman, the other fellow member of Alcoholics Anonymous she met, told her. And I go on retreat, and this woman's there, and she's distant to me, and I want to tell you that I respect this woman tremendously that she is a great service to other women in AA. And I'm telling you that in this instance, it was one sentence. In all others, it's not. <laughs> My character assassination was never one sentence. Um, but I sense something, and I don't know what it is. And through the sponsorship network, she's in some of the same networks, I find out that this woman knows this, and I'm just, I feel off. I was told point blank, I'm to call the woman I made the statement to first, and tell her that my insecurities, my jealousy, my this, my that, my crap is the reason I said that and I had no business saying that and putting that out in the universe and harming someone else that way. And then when I correct that, that I was told that any time I've committed character assassination and gossip, particularly things that I don't know to be truth, because it's just fun to talk about other people because it makes me feel better about me, um, that I am to go to all the people first. And that's correcting the harm. Then I go to the person I did it to. And then I went to that person. And I was able to say, I've corrected the harms I've done you. Now, I got an amends made to me last night. That was exactly that. Seven years worth that I've continually turned the other cheek, that I've taken the higher road, that if this person is on the right side of the street, I will cross to the left. This person then comes over and joins my home group, which I moved to to get away from her and her cronies and the garbage that was constantly. And I welcomed her at my home group and said she must be in pain that she's seeking somewhere new. And all the women around me said, oh, my God, she's here. And I said she must need us for something. Now, this woman comes to me last night. Do I have five minutes? This woman has continued. She came to me two, three years ago, and then continued all the same behavior. Burn me once, you know, shame on you. Burn me twice, shame on me. I don't care what you got to say. I'm still standing over here because, you know, I can be forgiving. Now, here's the thing is I have to be forgiving because if I don't forgive this woman, even if she continues to harm me, I'm blocked from God, and I don't want that. And she is not worth any piece of me being blocked from God. She's just not that important. Neither are the people you, my son or my parents, more important people in my life worth being blocked. But she comes at me with the same kind of my judgment, insincere amends of please forgive my transgressions. I'm like, what is this? And I know she's going through this work again, and um, I basically tell her, you know, that I wish you well on her path. Um, I, I couldn't sleep last night. It was over this. I'm thinking, you know, who? And she took me by surprise, and I didn't say much last night. But I knew this needed to be looked at, and I knew more needed to be said between her and I. And um, I took it to two people today. I got guidance, and I called her. And I asked her, I told her that I didn't feel her attempt was sincere, but that I don't know that it wasn't. That's just what I felt. 
and I was in no way putting her down. And she said, well, let me tell you, the reason you felt that is because um, you intimidate me, and I'm fearful around you, and so that's what you were getting instead of sincerity. I said, well, I don't want you to feel that way around me. I don't feel I've done anything for you to feel that way around me. And um, I asked her if she sincerely wanted to right this wrong, and she said yes, and I told her what I was taught. When you character assassinate and poison and try and turn people against each other, and she told me, um, well, that can be what you're taught, but I made my amends to you, and I don't feel I need to do that. I said, then you're, this isn't a finished amends as far as I'm concerned, and I appreciate your efforts, but they, this isn't done here. And um, I said, I suggest I'm going to request that you take what I've asked you to do to your sponsor, because I know her sponsor. I said I would, I would find it earth-shattering if she didn't agree that this was the amends because it was this woman's mother that taught me how to make this amends, and um, in particular. And she said that uh, she's not saying she won't do that, but it's none of my business if she does it or not. And her, her, it's between me and her. And I said, no, this isn't between me and you. When you involve all these other people, and we got nowhere. Um, but I told her that she is absolutely forgiven, because she, I will not have the resentments with her. She's been on every fourth step I've ever written in AA. And I asked her again, is there something I am doing to you that I keep getting this back? No, Allison, it's my stuff. You know, um, but I absolutely forgive her. And I still believe that when you character assassinate and gossip about someone, you need to go to all the other people. I um, think I'm, like, out of time. I have this, I have, like, all these great men's stories. I just have to tell a funny one. I have to end on a funny one, which isn't really funny, is... um. When I was drunk, I, I do these shows, and I was in Philadelphia at this big convention center, and in this same building was the Northeast Regional Convention of Little People. Needless to say, there were 500 little people, because I'm going to be pit- politically correct on tape, because that is not what I was calling them, okay, um, running around. So every place I went were three steps, like front desk, bar, most important, bar, four bars in this joint, sports bar, jazz club, nightclub, Three steps. I can't get, there's three steps. I can't even get in the bathroom. There's three steps for them. What about me? Because I'm the center of the universe and these steps are in my way and all these people are, little people are in my way. Well, you spend on a business trip that you show up for no business, drunk and high, round the clock. These people start to get on your nerves because they are definitely in collision with what you want, your instincts. I um, am in the sports bar on Saturday night, and I um, start playing duck, duck, goose. I am this. I am not making fun of them or creating a harm right now. There's a point to why I'm laughing. I mean, I'm laughing because it's funny. And I'm slamming them on the head. And, you know, well, I'll get to that. Duck, duck, goose, you're it, running through the bar. And go back upstairs to my room when the bar closes, and my mother comes in my room in the morning and says, there's a lynch mob looking for you. Do do not come out. This is absolutely true. Do not come out of this room tomorrow. And I already not show. I, I think my mother thought if we bring her, she'll work, even though I hadn't worked in years. All I did was create havoc. I mean, at the front desk. Do you know who I am? Why is in my room ready? I mean, my mother put me in a van with the workers. I made them stop in Washington Heights. They filled up a container with a bottle of vodka. I fell out of the van two hours later in Philadelphia. I mean, fell and then went to create. I was just an absolute nightmare. Again, no recollection of this till I'm at the convention, the North uh, Area 44 convention, and there's a guy from the Highland Park group who's a little person. And I see him, and it was like, whoosh, like I was right back there. And I'm like, oh, my God. And I remember what I did. I immediately go to my sponsor, and she's like, you need to make amends. I'm like, no kidding. But I'm laughing. She's laughing. I'm laughing. I'm like, I'm laughing. I still find this amusing. She says, Allison, we did funny things when we drank. She made me go to that guy. I found him in Highland Park. And said, he's probably suffered abuse like this his whole life. You go to him and you ask him what the right way to make amends is. I'd go to this man and not laugh. Although he found it amusing also. Um, and ask him how to set this matter straight. And he told me to write a letter to the Northeast Regional Convention of Little People. And, and I did. <laughs> um, you know, and, um, 
I love that little dude in Highland Park today. Like, I've called him. He's come on commitments. He's come to our group. Oh, but I got to tell you the harms I did. Can you imagine having something that makes you feel separate and different from people? And I certainly have my own, what I think are weaknesses and liabilities and things that I wish were different. And to have someone just slam it in your face, um, my behavior was appalling. And that was the absolute best I could do that day. That's where alcohol takes me. Do unfinished amends have anything to do with whether I drink again or not? Yes. I know I went over. I could really just, I have a lot of amends. I, I really thought the one with my dad was important because it just spiraled. And I want to tell you that um, God is mentioned regularly in my home and my parents. You know, um, what a gift. Who would have thought? You know, my dad's actually called me. All I ever wanted was for him to like me and be proud. He's actually called me out of nowhere. Not because I was seeking that. I said, you know, we're proud of you. And I thought, oh, my God. When you stop looking, it comes. You know? Um, anyway, um, thank you again for having me here. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.